that back on there. Okay, so we're, <clears throat> we're going to wrap up by largely talking about American English and some differences between American and British English. We'll go into a little bit of detail about um, American dialects. I haven't decided yet whether or not we'll get into African American vernacular English. Um, we'll just see how the night goes on. But starting up there at the top of um, the notes, skipping the little paragraph at the top, the introduction, okay? What we've been doing all semester long, okay, is historical linguistics. It has its heyday in the 19th century. Um, we talked, you know, back when we were in the Germanic stuff about Sir William Jones and his discovery of the precursor, the parent, if you want to call it, of, you know, Latin, Sanskrit, Greek, etc., and, and what he wrote in the Journal of the Asiatic Society in 1785. Okay, that's just a few years before the advent of the 19th century. Um, but you really see this, this take off in the 19th century, the whole field of historical linguistics and philology. Um, the next item there. The language obviously doesn't stop. That is, verb, ch verb forms are changing. Okay, that continues into the 19th century. I don't think we see that as much into the 20th and 21st century, though we are seeing more strong verbs become weak verbs, things like that. You know, the example I give up there, this is a, a new development. The phrase, the house is being built, that is being built, that progressive past. Okay, Dickens wrote, the house is building. Okay, is building. It's progressive. It's future. Okay. Um, notice we don't use the Dickensian form any longer. Okay. What else happens? Decline of British English as a national standard. Excuse me, as an international standard. Why? Well, how does the 19th century begin? Directly after the. Directly after the American Revolution, okay, that signals the beginning of kind of the downfall of the British Empire. It's gradual at first. I mean, the British Empire is still very, very strong well into, you know, the first third of the 20th century. Um, you know, once they lose India in, what is it, 1947, I think. That pretty much signals the real end of the British Empire. But when these puny little colonies throw off British rule, um, that starts the decline. Okay? What comes kind of as a corollary with that is the rise of American English. Okay? That doesn't hit its peak until First and Second World Wars. Okay. When it's the United States that essentially is the cause for the winning of World War I, and it's the United States entry into the Second World War that is ultimately the cause of the winning of that war. It's also because in the 19th century, although the Industrial Revolution is well underway in the United Kingdom, you know, there are quite a few American inventors who invent things that spread around the world, like the telephone, the telegraph, okay, that have a huge impact on um, language. During the 19th century, slang becomes more commonly accepted. Okay, um, we don't know. We're not positive of where the word slang comes from. William Skeet, W. W. Skeet, who is a famous um, lexicographer in the 19th century and etymologist. He argues that it comes from the Old Norse verb slengja, which means to sling. And it's like you're slinging words. You're just kind of getting something to stick on a wall, as it uh, were. A British author, Captain Sir Francis Gross, writes the first dictionary of slang in 1785. Okay? Notice the title of this. A Classical Dictionary of the Vulgar Tongue. Can you be any more paradoxical you know, than that. 
Because by vulgar tongue, he doesn't mean like vulgar Latin, which is common, everyday, ordinary, spoken Latin. He means street speech. Okay? And then you have other dictionaries of slang throughout the 19th century and on into the 20th century. Um, either C.T. Onions or Eric Partridge did one for Oxford Press in the mid-20th century. Okay? There's a problem, however, with writing a dictionary of slang. A, a dictionary of slang is not like the Oxford English Dictionary. Why? Slang doesn't stick around for that long. Bingo. Slang comes and goes. You know, um, you know that word I just used, bingo, probably 30 years from now won't be used at all because the game won't be around anymore. But, you know, slang from when... You know, I was a teenager or even younger, you know, late 60s, 70s, groovy, far out, you know, those kind people don't use those anymore, okay? Slang has a very, very short shelf life. I mean, sometimes it's a matter of months. Other times, yeah, it can last longer, and it can go in and out of fashion. Slang terms that were, you know, popular... 30 years ago can die out of fashion and then they can be resurrected when the children of those who are using them discover them and they get revived. Okay, What else? The influ influence of science on language. Well, what was the 19th century? The rise of the industrial age. I mean, it's the industrial revolution. So you have all kinds of new industries created and you have New scientific developments, the telephone, the telegraph, early part of the 20th century, the television, okay, the automobile in the 19th century, railroads, okay. So every time you have a, an advent of a new technology, new words enter the language as a result, you know. This thing was not even around 30 years ago. You didn't have laptops. Yeah, you had portable computers, but they were big, bulky, like suitcases, okay? And they were considered portable because they only weighed 30 pounds. This thing weighs like 7 pounds, and it's not, you know, if any of you have an, uh, an Apple Air, you know, it's a couple pounds, okay? So a lot happens as a result of that. Spelling reform gets a, a push in the 19th century, okay? Um, American author William Dean Howells supported uh, spelling reform. Teddy Roosevelt supported spelling reform. In fact, my father sent me an email two or three days ago. There's just an article, I think, in the Wall Street Journal about Teddy Roosevelt's support of spelling reform in the early part of the um, 20th century. George Bernard Shaw argued for it. Um, Noah Webster, who we'll talk about in a little bit, strongly argued for it. He didn't get the spelling reform he wanted. He got some minor spelling reform that we'll talk about, which is why we spell some words differently than the Brits do. Defense, color, humor, things like that. Okay? Uh, saw the rise of Esperanto during this period, which was, you know, a whole new language. Didn't go anywhere. Okay? I think probably Tolkien's invented languages have had more impact than Esperanto. And maybe even Klingon. Yes? Esperanto actually has native speakers now. It has native speakers? Mm -hmm. People who, uh, mostly people whose parents met at like, Esperanto conventions. Yeah, okay. <laughs> they didn't like, grow up speaking it as their native tongue. All right. <laughs> it still would be debatable whether or not it's a, a native or natural right. language, right. though. Yeah. Yeah, I do know Klingon has more <laughs> of a following than Esperanto. Yeah, I'm sure Klingon has a... Well, and like I said, you know, um, Tolkien's invented linguistics. I mean, there are, just as there are Esperanto societies and such, um, there are groups devoted to publishing dictionaries of Tolkien's languages, and there are multiple of these. There are societies. Uh, I had a friend in, in high school who spoke Elvish fluently. Wow. Really scary <laughs> personally even though I love Tolkien um, 
English in the 20th century. Let me put this up on... overhead. Um, all the material from the middle of the page up comes from David Crystal's Cambridge Encyclopedia of Language, which I actually used in this class once, several years ago. It didn't work as well. It probably worked a little better than this book. I don't know that I'll use this again, but anyways. English is the largest of the Occidental, meaning Western languages. 350 million speakers using it as a first language. It's even more than that now, okay? Because we have 350 million speakers in America, okay? Um, you know, another, I don't know what the population of the United Kingdom is. It's not great. 25 million, maybe. Um, and then all the other Anglophone countries like Australia, New Zealand, etc. Okay, uh, at least twice that number. Again, this is 1987. Use English regularly as a second language. My wife was, you know, mentioning something the other day because she's going to Germany for a couple weeks this summer to see her sister. And she was like, you know, I'm gonna have to learn some German phrases. She had a year of German in college, and I said, you won't need to worry about it because everybody in Germany speaks English. Uh, it's required. Okay. Um, Chinese is by far the world's largest language, okay, with over a billion speakers. India, a um, couple of the languages in India would probably be larger also, definitely be larger than English since India also has over a billion speakers, if I remember correctly. But they've got multiple languages, like um, Punjab and Hindi and things like that, okay. Comparison with some other European languages. Spanish, 250 million. Russian, 150. Again, this is as of 1987. Portuguese, 135 million. Because keep in mind, Portuguese isn't only spoken in that little strip of land on the, on the coast of Spain called Portugal. It's also the language, the national language of Brazil, which is huge. Okay? German, 100 million. French, 70 million. Italian, 60 million. Okay? Vocabulary. Modern English has approximately approximately a half million words in use. Okay? Merriam Webster's Dictionary of 61 lists 450,000. Okay? Why does English have so many? Russian notices a distant second. Well, what have we been talking about? What does English do? It steals. It takes, it freely allows words from other languages to enter the vocabulary, okay? Despite this enormous vocabulary, and I don't know when Gerlach computed this, these are notes that um, I had when I took this kind of course back in 1989-1990. These are the notes our professor sold to us. <laughs> um, a high schooler's average vocabulary, and I would put money that it's lower than this now, was 71,000. College student, 85,000. Okay? That's the vocabularies of the average. Shakespeare's vocabulary is recorded in all of his plays and his four long poems and the sonnets is just over 20,000. Okay? American English grows around rate 3,000 words a year, 5,000 in a time of war or turmoil, like the various Gulf Wars, the Vietnam War, etc. Not all the languages, excuse me, not all the words remain in the standard vocabulary. Okay? But English is a terse language. That is, we say a lot with as few syllables as possible. Look at this example. Okay? One scholar looked at the number of syllables it takes to translate the Gospel of Mark. English. This is total number of syllables for the entire book. 29,000. Now, this would depend on, and I don't know which version this is based on. And I don't know if it's based on the King James, the New Living Bible, the modern New American Standard, what? Because, again, 
I would lay money if it were based on King James, okay, versus a contemporary translation, the contemporary translation would probably use more syllables because they're not as terse and direct as the King James. The Teutonic languages, which means the Germanic languages, 32,650. Why? Just what's one of the little things we've learned? What happens with English and inflections? We drop them off. German and the Germanic languages are still highly inflected languages. The Romance languages are even more inflected. Okay? So, when you have more inflections, you have more syllables. All right? Romance languages, over 40,000 syllables. Notice, it's like one and a half times English. Okay, now this is some old data, but still. 1953, a guy named Michael West studied English word frequency. Here's what he discovered. The most common word in English is and. We're always joining things, okay? Followed by certain prepositions. Those prepositions, a thousand years ago, would hardly have been used when the language was still analytical, still inflected, okay? But because it's not analytical now, it's all based on syntax, word order, those prepositions become very, very important. Then, to be with its inflections and the various auxiliary verbs, will, shall, etc. He also noted that man is used six times more often than woman, but mother eight times more often than father. So what does that say about sexist language? It's kind of a wash. I, almost twice as much as you, and take three times more often than give. So it's kind of a narcissistic language, too, it appears. Okay? Jacob Grimm <coughs> of the Grimm's Fairy Tales and the Teutonic Grammar said, In riches, good sense, and terse convenience, no other of the living languages may be put beside it. You know, and if you need an example of terseness, if you've never read it before, yeah, hold on just one second. Just look at this. The Gettysburg Address. 206 words. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty, dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives and that nation that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. Lincoln's almost half done with this address, which is widely regarded as the greatest speech in American history, and as one of the greatest speeches in all history. But, in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men living and dead who struggled here have consecrated it, far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note and wrong remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. 
Now it would be an interesting little study to go through that speech, count the number of words, and count the number of syllables. Just by looking at it, the vast majority of the words are one or two syllables. All those that are three syllables, I believe, are of Latin origin. Most of the words that are one or two syllables are native English. Okay? Showing that terseness of the language. Okay? Let me go back to, uh, actually, go back to the PC and. Back to the notes. <clears throat> so that's kind of English in the um, 20th century. A little bit dated, but. So the English language in America, when does it come? What's the first settlement in America? Jamestown, Virginia, 1607. Second settlement, Plymouth Colony, Plymouth Bay Colony, 1620. The Pilgrims, okay? So, pilgrims arrive, Jamestown settlers arrive, and what are they immediately confronted with? A new reality. Yeah, trees are trees, but they're not the same kinds of trees. They have different kinds of topography than they've seen back in England. They have different kinds of animals that they've, than they've seen back in England. Okay? For example, they have raccoons. There aren't raccoons in England. So they see this funny thing and they've got to come up with a name for it. How do they do that? Well, three different ways. They could take old world names and words and apply them to new situations. For example, Bedford, England, New Bedford. Hampshire, New Hampshire. York, New York for place names, okay? Trout, they have trout in England. Looks the same or looks similar. Let's give it the same name, okay? They can come up with new names or words like bushwhack or underbrush. Notice both of those terms are doing what? They're compounding. Native Old English facility. Take two things that are dissimilar, stick them together. Okay, what else? Borrow words from foreign tongues. For example, you could borrow words from the Amerindian languages. Okay, caribou, chipmunk, raccoon, squaw, wigwam, hickory, moccasin, etc. Um, you got a whole section, chapters ten through twelve, which I said we wouldn't discuss, but read them. Okay, for the final exam next week. They're all about, essentially, development of the lexicon. How new words get added into the vocabulary, how new words get created, etc. Um, I think you'll actually find them probably more interesting than just about everything else um, you've read. Um, go into that. For example, other stuff from um, Indian. Names. Chicago. Chattahoochee. Chattanooga. Mississippi, okay. Um, why, why so few borrowings, however? Other than place names and animal names, why do we have so few Amerindian words, Native American words, in English? Probably for the same reason we have so few Celtic words. Defeated people's languages don't usually influence the dominant language a lot. What did, really in the 19th century, because we didn't see this happening in the 18th century and earlier, what did the 19th century federal government policies start to do with Native Americans? Push them west and put them on reservations, okay, where you then get a little interaction. Okay. What other kinds of borrowings? What other languages? French, Dutch, Spanish, German, French. Gopher, pumpkin, chowder, praline, bayou, flume, levee, prairie, Apache, 
Bureau Depot sent. I don't think there's anything else. Over there. No. Dutch boss, as in superior overlord kind of a thing, not the old 60s boss, you know, that's cruel kind of a thing. Bush meaning back country. Cookie, gotta love the Dutch for that at least. Dope meaning dummy. Dumb meaning stupid. Pit meaning seed, okay, like a cherry pit. Slay, snoop, spook. Is that what that is, Stooge? Can't see it all. Uh, waffle, Yankee. Yankee probably is a Dutch pejorative. Okay. And it probably comes from a name, Jan Key. Okay. So a Yankee is someone from kind of Dutch New York, as it were. Spanish, 10 gallon hat. Huskal, Burrow, Canyon, Mesa, Savvy, Vigilante, Buckaroo, German and Yiddish, Blintz, Schlepp, Schlepper, Schmaltz, Schnoz, Schnozzle, pretty much a lot of the schn words, okay? And in American periods and patterns of migration, um... Here just a second because I think I've got this doesn't really give you the patterns of migration, but it does give you a different dialect chart than the one that's in the um, notes. Okay. First of all, periods of migration, three main periods. Okay. Um, beginnings to about 1790. So 1607, let's say, Jamestown, to 1790, colonial period. Where are those people coming from? England. Primarily England, like 95% of them. Second major period, 1790 to about 1890. Okay. Um, these period, uh, the people who come from 1790 to 1890 are primarily coming from Northern Europe, okay? Irish, German, Swiss, uh, Dutch, okay? Scandinavians who are settling in Minnesota and Wisconsin, areas up there, okay? Third major period, 1890 on to today, okay? And you could probably really say the, the real emphasis in that period is from like 1790 to about 1920, okay? Where you get a lot of Southern Europeans, Italians, okay? And Eastern Europeans, Slavs, the Poles, the Czechs, the Slovaks, or what used to be called the Czechoslovaks, um, it's during those, those major periods, for example, the, the post-1840s, that you see a lot of Irish because of the Irish potato famine. And what do they do? They settle in enclaves in these big cities in the Northeast and Upper Midwest so that you get, you know, kind of pockets of Irishness, okay? You get Little Italy in um, New York after about 1790, the period from about 1790, 1790 to 1910. I mean, this is, it's the post-1790 when Ellis Island is at its heyday in terms of people coming in. You know, you, you do have throughout this period, um, southern border, Spanish Americans coming across. Keep in mind, California is part of Mexico until 1849. Well, Earlier than that, becomes a state in 1849. Um, same with New Mexico, Arizona, Texas. I mean, Alamos in the 1840s. I don't remember the exact date. Uh, but the Alamos fought during the 1840s. It's only after that that Texas actually becomes a state. 
etc. You've had Spain in Florida, in the southern, uh, the Gulf states, throughout Louisiana, Mississippi, and parts of Alabama. Not as much in Georgia, but a little bit. Okay, so you have those those three major periods, and that's where the individuals largely came from. So, if you look at the first period, up to about 1790, where are they primarily settling? These are the English. New England. I mean, yeah, you do have Jamestown in Virginia, okay? But other than that, it's primarily New England, New York, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, okay? The Carolinas to some extent. Then in that second major period, where you have the Irish and the Scots largely come over and the Germans come over, the Germans largely settle in Pennsylvania. I mean, that's why they have an entire region of the state called Pennsylvania Dutch Country, okay? It's not just because they're Dutch, it's they're German, largely. Um, the Irish and the Scots come in, they like the Appalachians, and then they come across the Appalachians and down into the south, largely. Italians settle primarily in the northeast and the upper Midwest, Chicago and New York, largely. Okay. The Poles and the, the other Slavs also stick largely to those large cities, um, New York, Chicago, Philadelphia, not so much Boston. They don't go that far north um, in the northeast. Back to the notes. Yes. I have a question concerning mm -hmm. dialects. Um, okay. I heard once that the closest thing we have to probably, I guess it would be like 18th century English accents are found in like the southern drawl that you find in Georgia. Is that necessarily true? No. Okay. Um, that's based on this idea that that if you want to find, you know, Language closest to Shakespeare, go up in the mountains of Appalachia. It's kind of true, but it's also not true. And we'll talk about that right now when we get to British versus American English. When the settlers from Britain came over, okay, they began, as I said, 1607. They're continuing throughout the colonial period into just after the revolutionary period. Um, yeah, I mean, you, obviously, immigration doesn't stop from England because we can. A lot of people can trace their ancestors through the early part of the 18th century and the 1820s, 30s, 40s, etc. But largely, those people who come over, they come, they settle, <clears throat> and they get separated from England because you have, you know, the Atlantic, 3,000 miles of water separating them. What happens when one linguistic group? breaks off from its parent group. Let me put it this way. The parent group still has kind of um, interchange and commerce and such with other linguistic groups. So what's going to go on with that parent group? Okay, it's going to continue evolving. But this group over here is not. Because it's not going to have that outside influence, that external history involving with it. Okay? So what happens in the United States is these English speakers of early 17th century English come over and the language kind of gets frozen here. Yeah, there's involvement with American Indian and there's a little bit of involvement with French Okay, through the French and Indian Wars, for example, and Spanish. But it's not like being back over in Europe, where there's everyday commerce going on between speakers of many different languages. Okay? So, the English that is brought over to America kind of stops. But English in England keeps on evolving. So, American English does preserve an older, more archaic form of the language. In other words, the English I speak, or the English you speak, 
is, in that sense, closer to Shakespeare's English than is the English of Queen Elizabeth or Prince Charles. Okay? Because their language kept changing. How? Well, that's some of the things we're going to talk about here in just a minute. Skip the receive pronunciation for a moment, and we'll talk about the pronunciation differences, because these are the older forms and features that we're talking about. The American English short or flat aw. This, by the way, um, shows up on pages 204 briefly, but page 213 in your textbook. I wrote this down <laughs> earlier today. <coughs> this is the eh sound. Grass. Path. Okay? It's the eh in cat. American English preserves the original pronunciation, or what would be better said, the earlier pronunciation. British English changed. I say about the time of the Revolution. It's actually a little bit later than that. It's about... Um, it's in the early 18th century that br that British English eh becomes aw. So you have in British English puff, grass, rather than path, grass. Okay? What else? American English retention of what's called a strong post vocalic R. An R in a word that comes after a vowel. Bird, er. You know, think thumper, or think Bambi. Bird. Okay? But it's the er there. English doesn't have that. It's pronounced bud. Okay? American English, car. British English, caw. Okay? Now, we do see that lack of the post-vocalic R in some dialects of American English. For example, Harvard, or Boston English. Okay? Pak the ka in Havid Yad. Okay? But then you also see kind of a flip of that, where British English adds R's in certain instances, and also Boston English. And this happened si kind of simultaneously, but completely unrelated. Okay? Where Boston English does the same thing. Pull up a YouTube video of JFK, and you'll hear him talking about ideas, okay, or Cuba. I mean, watch stuff about the Cuban Missile Crisis, and he'll talk about Cuba has put missiles on the island, okay. He's dropping in that R there, okay. Um, you know, I give the example of American English pronunciation, should be pronunciation, <laughs> of her, girl, bird, British English girl, or sometimes even gel, like G-E-L-L, -L, rhymes with hell, okay? American English nasalized pronunciation. It's one of the things that drives Brits crazy. They sound like they think Americans all talk through their noses. We all talk like this. <laughs> this is what we sound like to the English. Okay? They don't have that. American English pronunciation of even stressless syllables. Okay? We say laboratory. They say laboratory. Yes? What is some examples of the nasalized pronunciation? Because I can't tell the difference. Like, when I hear English people speak, it's like the same, like... Other than, I mean, obviously they're... You'd have to... I couldn't give you an example because it would be me portraying it. You'd have to pull up, you know, a YouTube example of... Um, I don't know. You'd have to find one. Uh, a website of, you know, a British person speaking a passage and then an American English... American person speaking the same passage. It'd have to be that so kind of like comparison. Lines with, like, the N and the... No, it's it's more like what I the example I gave of forcing yeah forcing the air to go into the nasal cavity. So we do that as the British. Yeah, they hear Fran Drescher. 
<laughs> when they hear Americans. Okay. Um, and you got you again in your book. Um, I didn't write down this. You do have. Examples of some of the different um, pronunciations of words like, let's see where it was, you know, evolution, evolution, um, aluminium, aluminum, or aluminum, I should say. Okay, there's an Australian person I know that. Aluminium. Yeah, because yeah, I thought it was weird. Yeah. The weirdest thing. Because Australian comes from British English. Um, new words from old pronunciation. You know, Americans um, say things like Edinburgh. It's Edinburgh. They say things like Worcestershire, it's Worcester, okay, or, or Chichester, Chichester. If Americans go to England and they go to this castle, do I remember how this part is spelled? I think that's it. They say Bolo. It's not. It's Bewley. Is that an N that you No, it's a U, sorry. Oh, okay. Beauty, like in beauty, okay? Mm -hmm. But we see that as being from French, and it's beau. Yeah. But it's not. It's beau. And so this thing is beauty, okay? Um, there's, and there's tons of examples like that, okay? Difference in lexicon. Um, well, America is more monotonous than British English. We have less variety, even in our dialects. I mean, man, you go to London, and you walk from um, just east of Tower Hill Bridge, or Tower Bridge, in the Tower of London, and you walk down the Strand... And you go all the way past, um, get on Oxford Street and go all the way past um, Buckingham Palace and keep going down past Hyde Park, past Kensington, okay? You're going to hear quite a few different dialects just in Oxford, okay? For example, you're going to walk through, you're going to go through the center of what used to be Cockney. Okay? It was said that you weren't a Cockney. You could only call yourself a Cockney if you were born within earshot okay, of the ringing of the bells of St. Mary Le Beau Church, which is uh, about a quarter of a mile from St. Paul's Cathedral. Okay? Very famous church. True Cockneys were born within earshot of hearing that bell ringing. So if you could still hear that bell, you were considered a Cockney. Okay? But Cockney wasn't a, you know, a social status. It was all about the form of speech that you spoke. Okay? Uh, difference in lexicon. You know, these are just a couple of little examples. Your book gives you a whole bunch. American English, again, is more archaic. We use the older forms. Skip the first two and go to the season, fall. The Brits don't call it fall. They call it autumn. Okay? And again, that was a change that began in the 19th century. As of the American Revolution, it was still called fall in England. Okay? But look at the other two. Mad which we often use to mean angry. In Britain, mad means crazy, insane. Okay? Gotten versus got. We say get, got, gotten. 
The Brits have get and got. They don't say things like, I have gotten a job. They will say, I have got a job. Okay? And then, um, you know, different words for the same thing. What we call an apartment, they call a flat. What we call gas, they call petrol. What we call a wrench, they call a spanner. What we call a truck, they call a lorry. What we call a subway, they call a tube. You know what a subway is in England? Have any of you been to London or anywhere in England? Do you remember what a subway is? Well, the subway is like what goes under the street so you can cross. Exactly. A subway is a, like a tunnel that goes under the street so you can cross from one side to the other without having to fight traffic. Okay? What we say if you go into rent an apartment, you let an apartment. Okay? A hood, like the hood of a car, is the bonnet. But the trunk of the car is the boot, okay? Potato chips are crisps, if you've ever read the Harry Potter novels, and compared the British and American versions, okay? Um, the British versions keep crisps for the first two or three, and then they change and use American forms for like the last three books. It's really weird. What we call Scotch tape, notice, which is a brand name, they call cello tape, just like Kleenex is a brand name. Okay, they call it just tissue. Call me means <coughs> ring me. None of them use that anymore because now it's text me. Okay, um, and again, your book gives you uh, a bunch of different examples there. Okay, spelling variations. I'm not going to talk about the spelling variations yet because the spelling variations. The reason the American spellings are different is because of Noah Webster. He changes the spellings. That's why, you know, if, if I get a student's paper and they spell the word color, C-O-L-O-U-R, it's not wrong. It's just a different register. It's British English. And if you are, um, if you're an English major and you read a lot of British English, you can't help but adopt some of those spelling forms. Okay. Um, British versus American standards in language. Okay. American English has a respect for rules and books. Notice my little pun there, the har gag brace, the har brace handbook, okay. which I absolutely detest. We, we Americans kind of say, if I can find it in a book, then it's proven. Brits don't do that. Okay. Not as much, okay? They're becoming more like that. Um, they have more respect for the spoken word of the upper classes, okay? Which go, takes me back up to point one up there. Received pronunciation. Received pronunciation is the standard of English essentially taught in the upper form schools or in the private schools in places like Eton and Harrow and Oxford and Cambridge. Right. And in the 19th century, there was this move in England to teach received pronunciation to the middle classes to enable people to better themselves, okay, to get out of kind of this lower class language. And J.K. Rowling does some interesting things even with this in the Harry Potter novels. Because of what she had, what she puts in the mouth of Draco Malfoy, for example, about Hagrid and Hagrid's speech patterns. You know, he calls him a big dumb oaf because he can't even speak properly. Because Hagrid speaks a, a, a kind of a weird mixture. It's not really Cockney. It's not really Northern English. It's kind of an amalgam of various um, substandard varieties. Let's say, okay. But American English, we don't have that kind of respect for the spoken word. We have the respect for the written word. Even though, you look at our purveyors of kind of a national dialect or national pronunciation, what is that national pronunciation or dialect? Is it the 
Boston dialect of the Kennedys? Is it the Arkansas dialect of Bill Clinton? No. It's general Midwestern. Okay. It's kind of, you know, the, the greatest exemplar of that, he's, he's no longer a, a, a network news guy, and he doesn't speak very clearly any longer, but 20 years ago it was Tom Brokaw. You know, a good North Dakota, clear, succinct accent. You know, Dan Rather also to some extent, but Dan Rather every now and then would let his Texas drawl out. Okay, Walter Cronkite, you couldn't tell where he was born when he was back on the news. Or some of the great n newscasters of the 60s, Eric Severide, um, Huntley and McGee, you couldn't tell what part of the country they came from. You couldn't tell that they were from the Northeast or the Southwest, L.A., for example. Okay, Peter Jennings, when he was broadcasting, if you didn't know he was from Canada... The only time you would be able to tell when he would say a boot for about. Okay. I'm not going to talk about other miscellaneous differences. I mean, there are varieties of things. American English use of what are called functional shifts. Okay. The functional shifts are defined in chapter 10 or 11, I think it is. Um, You've got the definition there, essentially. Shifting a word's part of speech. That is, turning a verb into a noun. Or turning a noun into a verb. For example, contact. Contact, originally, is a noun. It's the coming together of two things. Okay? It gets changed to a verb. I will contact you. But that doesn't mean I'm going to touch you. See, that's where contact is. It's touching of two things. Okay? So that's one example. Back formations. Back formations is taking a word and saying, well, okay, let's use burglar. You've got a burglar. That must mean that there must have been one who burgles. And you have butlers. That must mean there must have been People who buttle. Okay? This is an American thing. But one thing that it shows is it shows that ingenuity in creation of words that the Anglo Saxons had. Okay? And there are others, you know, like the butt and the butler and buttle one. There's um one that's not used very much, but you can actually, I think it does actually show up in the OED, usher to ush, which is really strange. What else? American use of compounding. Well, we already saw bushwhack, okay, um, underbrush, backcountry, hard drive, <coughs> notice these, interface, all words from, those are both words from technology, because the technology was invented here, okay, Bushwhack, hamburger, hot dog, you know, keyboard. Yes? So compounding is just taking two words that are really separate, just throwing them together? Yep. I mean, often the words have some relation to the thing. It's, you know, we call these things keys, so key, and it looks like they're on a board. Well, what does a piano have? It has keys. But it kind of looks like they're on a board, but we don't call it the keyboard. Unless, of course, it's the kind that you can stick in a sack and walk around with you. In which case, it is called a keyboard. Okay? Um, what else? American use of affixes. We throw aff endings on words. You know, Ted Turner's company used to love to colorize old black and white films, or to martinize, it's a way of dry cleaning, to deputize, to make somebody one of these things. We also use traditional, you know, Latin affixes. We throw an O-R on something, or we throw an E-E -E on something, so that now we not only have mentors, we have mentees, those who are 
mentored, not minted, okay? Just like we have employers, well, we have employees. American English hyperbole, humongous, stupendous, ginormous, you know, totally awesome, etc. You don't see that kind of um, hyperbole in, in British English, not nearly to the extent that we see it in American English. Okay. Any questions before we go on? <coughs> Growth of American or national consciousness of American English. Okay. Early dominance of British standards in language and culture. Well, one of the things American settlers had to do, keep in mind, when they came here, they were British. They weren't American. Oh, until at least the middle of the 18th century. Kind of at the beginning of the revolutionary period, 1750s. Did they start kind of thinking themselves as Americans? But even then, they still considered themselves to be subjects to the English crown. Okay? The very term Americanism, first used by John Witherspoon, Witherspoon pres president of Princeton, member of the Continental Congress, signer of the Declaration of Independence, um, I think also in the Constitution. He first used the term Americanism in 1781. We didn't have quote-unquote American literature until after the founding. Okay, And I don't mean founding 1607, 1620. I mean after 1776. The first Real writer, I would argue at least, of American literature is James Fenimore Cooper, who kind of creates this American mythos that we don't see in earlier writers. Not even people like, um, well, Hawthorne's after that, so Hawthorne works. Um, Pickering writes a dictionary of Americanisms. That's the whole title, by the way a vocabulary or collection of words and phrases which have been supposed to be peculiar to the United States of America, to which is prefixed an essay on the present state of the English language in the United States, 1816. Okay. Pickering's dictionary, however, was of words that are to be removed from the English language. Remember what the 18th century was all about in England? Ascertainment, fixing the language removing it of its impurities, okay? And then, you know, Fenimore Cooper's emphasis on making an American literature and culture. And he was the first, excepting Anne Bradstreet, he was the first major American writer to achieve prominence in Europe. He actually went and did a series of lectures in the UK and stuff like that, okay? Spelling reform, proposal for an academy. Ben Franklin advocated spelling reform. Ben Franklin also wanted the turkey to be our national bird, so enough said there. John Adams advocated an academy to preserve the purity of the language. Okay, Which I'm sure the Brits probably thought, purity, American English, doesn't quite work. So let's talk about Noah Webster. Okay. He lived a pretty long life, 88 years. He has four major works, the Grammatical Institute of the English Language, which has three parts to it, the most important one being the first one, the American Spelling Book, which we'll talk about in a moment, the Dissertations on the English Language of 1789, a Compendious Dictionary of the English Language, 1806, and then the American Dictionary of 1828. It's the American Dictionary that gets bought out by Miriam. And Miriam's name gets affixed to it. So that's the Miriam Webster. Miriam didn't do anything for the actual dictionary. Okay. Probably the most important of these is number one, an American spelling book. Usually called the Blueback Speller because it was bound in blue cloth. Okay. 
It wasn't only a spelling book. It gave pronunciation of words also. This thing went through a hundred million copies from the time it was published in 1783 until 1900. By which I mean there were over a hundred million in use. If you went to school in a public school, that was the spelling book you had. Okay. The American Dictionary of 1828, two big volumes, kind of like Samuel Johnson's, two volumes. 70,000 words. Notice what he does. He follows Johnson's format. It has edifying and exhortative quotations. Okay? Definitions are in chronological order. That is, he finds the earliest example, and then the next, and then the next, etc. And he includes alternate spellings. Okay? This is where he attempts the spelling reform. Quote from the dissertations. And Webster had been a schoolmaster. Okay. As an independent nation, our honor requires us to have a system of our own in language as well as government. Great Britain, whose children we are and whose language we speak, should no longer be our standard. In other words, why are we holding ourselves up to Addison and Steele or Samuel Johnson? or Dryden, or Pope, or Shakespeare, or Chaucer. For the taste of her writers is already corrupted. Okay? The Dissertations is written in 1789. And her language on the decline. But if it were not so, that is, and even if that wasn't true, she is at too great a distance to be our model and to instruct us in the principles of our own tongue. So what is, how he, is he going to instruct us in the principles of our own tongue? What Noah Webster thinks is best is essentially it. Okay? And it's from Webster that we get this idea of let's drop these silent, unpronounced letters like the U in color, in C-O-L-O-U-R or H-U-M-O-U-R. It's Webster who says, why do we spell defense, D-E-F-E-N-C-E, -E, when S is normally spelled with an S? Okay. <coughs> so notice, he changes defense to D-E-F-E-N-S-E, -E, but he doesn't change fence to F-E-N-S-E. -E. He changes theater from T-H-E-A-T-R-E to T-H-E-A-T-E-R, only to have it about 150 late years later changed by American snobs who want their theaters or their places of, you know, entertainment to have kind of a European flair to them. Similarly, we get buildings, center point, no longer spelled C-E-N-T-E-R, they're now spelled C-E-N-T-R-E, -E, so it sounds European and cosmopolitan, okay? Poor old Noah would be rolling in his grave. American dialectology. And I'll give you a website there to look up if you want. First point, the relative homogeneity, the relative monotony of American English. Um, it's possible in England to meet quote-unquote English speakers that you can't understand. And I don't mean you can't understand them because they're missing their teeth or, you know, they're drunk or something like that. But you can go to parts of Northeast England or Northwest England and almost have it be unintelligible. Okay? That's not really the case in the United States. Again, as with almost all rules, with a few exceptions. There are parts of the South, especially parts of the coastal South, South Georgia, the Gullah Islands, you know, or parts of Virginia, where it's almost unintelligible. Okay? Um, 
The Linguistic Atlas of the United States and Canada was begun in 1939. And the idea was to do exactly what it says, to make an atlas. And it's huge. Now, this thing is massive. A couple of terms. An isogloss, a, bi a, a boundary of a dialect feature. Let me show you. This is kind of cool. This is of the southeast. Okay, The black dots are where people use the word chigger, and the circles are where people use the word red bug. Okay? So the isogloss is the boundary between the two. Notice it's not real um, hard and fast because you do have some little dips down into South Carolina, excuse me, down into Georgia, and a couple in Florida. Okay, but other than that, I mean, it's pretty generally above that line of North Georgia, you know, Atlanta, Birmingham, uh, a little bit north of Stark, about Tupelo, north of Mississippi, it's all chiggers. Okay. So that's an example of an isogloss. Okay. A dialect area is where you have bundles of isoglosses. If I put, put on the um, overhead a thing that showed you that isogloss, that is with chigger, and then did a whole bunch of other words, like the difference between um, the pronunciation greasy, greasy, skillet, frying pan, faucet, spigot, um, bucket, pail, okay? So that you could see a whole bunch of different uh, isoglosses in one area that would then give you a dialect area. That's what these are showing you. Okay, multiple dialect areas. Okay, look, you know, over here in the eastern part of the country. Notice you've got more dialects over here, and they kind of level out as you move west. If we use this one that I had up earlier. Notice it's even more simplistic. You've got Eastern New England. Notice a little separate one for New York City, Middle Atlantic, Virginia Piedmont, Eastern Carolina, but then a general Southern, South Midland, North Midland, Inland Northern, and then what happens once you reach the Rockies? General American. Okay. This one suggests, however, that you have Rocky Mountain, Southwestern, Upper Midwestern, Pacific Northwest, Pacific Southwest. Personally, I wouldn't consider San Francisco or the Bay Area even, which is where I'm from, as any part of the Pacific Southwest. And people from San Jose where I'm from, they would not consider themselves part of the Southwest at all. They consider themselves, you know, that's Northern California. It's a different breed entirely than the L.A. area. Okay. Well, it shows that it's like got its own Yeah, it's got, a, it's got its own little San Francisco, San Francisco hipster, you know, <laughs> is essentially what that is. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty much what that is. Um, focal areas, center of the dialect. So, I mean, look at South Midland. Center of the dialect, you know, if you were to take that, would probably be somewhere right around Memphis. Okay. If you took Rocky Mountain, it, you know, it wouldn't even be Denver. It'd be like Salt Lake City, okay? Pacific Northwest would be in the middle of the Oregon Desert. Uh, Pacific Southwest would be about Sacramento, California, okay? <clears throat> um, I'm going to actually skip Skip the, the um, dialect areas and their supposed origins. And let me do this. This 
this will give you um, these are some of the dialectal characteristics of these areas. So northern, okay. O and all are distinguished. So you have morning, morning, fourteen, forty. See where I'm from, California. No distinction there. 1440. Morning, morning. There's no all in there at all. Okay? I in unstressed syllables of hunted, careless, not hunted, not careless. Centralized first element in diphthongs of fine, loud. Notice I did that accentuated there. Fine, loud. With, uh-uh, with. Greasy, roots, and because. Not because, because. Vocabulary, pale, where the Midland and Southern dialects call it a bucket. An angle worm, where the others call it an earthworm. Johnny Cake, where the Southerners and the Midlanders call it cornbread. And this next one, man, I, I've just never understood that. A spider for a frying pan. Okay. New York City. Okay. R is lost after vowels. It's a bud, ka, gill. Okay. No distinction between the morning, morning. I in both adjoin and adjoin, coil and coil, okay, goil, uh, a and all raised and lengthened in pan, lawn, think Cindy Lauper, okay, and you've, you've got the New York accent down, okay, a W, just a W in wheelbarrow, see, but then I don't have the in wheelbarrow anyways, okay, bottle, bottle, it's a glottal stop, it's not stopping on the teeth, it's not bottle, it's bottle, okay, and a duh instead of the in dis, dis car, dis girl, dis table, dis computer, etc., okay, New England, Lengthening of ah uh, to compensate for the loss of R in barn. So it's not just barn without the er, it's bon. Okay? Broad British awe in words like ask. Ask not what you can do for what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Dance, bath. So it's what makes New Englanders sound like snobs. Strong distinction between the O and the O, morning, morning, okay? Intrusive R and things like idea and cuber. A glide interjected after D in words like D U, D U. So you have to get that D U. Think of the word huge, depending on how you pronounce it, because some of you might pronounce it Y-U-J with a y and then in uj huge, huge, or it's huge, huge, okay? Like the way some people say the word new. They say new, okay? Midland. R kept after vowels, so bird, car, girl, etc. A excuse me, not A, E in Mary, Dairy, rather than Mary. Hear the difference? Mary, Mary, Meh, Meh, Mary, Dairy, A uh, in unstressed final syllable of haunted, haunted rather than haunted, F in with, and Er in my father does it still. He's 81 years old. Warsh. 
Washington. He would tell me when I was a kid, go out and wash the car. And I'm like, do what to the car, Dad? You know, because I was born and raised in California. We didn't say that. Okay. That's always bothered me. Yeah, it drives me nuts when, when I still when I hear it. Um, okay. Vocabulary, skillet for frying pan. Snake feeder for dragonfly. I've never heard that before. Poke for a paper bag. A little piece for a short distance. I guess in the south that'd be more like you know, go a little ways. Southern pronunciation. R is often lost after vowels. Okay. So that you'll sometimes hear tar. Ta for tire. Okay. Uh, a in Mary, Mary, Mary. It's like when my wife and I got married. One of her cousins, who's from South Georgia, from Podunksville, South Georgia, stood up when I walked out and said, Well, hey, Tayid. T E D became T A Y I D. Okay. Um, I, an unstressed syllable of hunt id. Okay. Palatal allophones of k and g in car and garden. That is, they're the same. Car, gar, and garden. Garden. Okay. Z in mrs. U in coop. O in poor, not poor. Z in greasy. Okay. And then, you know, simple vowels become diphthongs. Like Ted becomes Ted. Vocabulary, to low rather than to moo, but I don't see how that's southern. Think of something like um, the Christmas carol, Away in a Manger, where the cows are lowing, okay? That's British. Tote, to carry. Chitlins, I have no idea what the other one is. Pallet, a bed on the floor. My wife uses that. Hence, for honks. For ghost branch for a small stream, and then general American. This is you know you hit the Rockies and you're free. Flat a ah, in fast path. I don't think I've ever heard anybody even in the South say anything other than flat a ah, in fast and path. Unrounded vowel in hot top, but it's just hot top. Sorry. Retention of strong R everywhere. And less tendency than British English to introduce a glide after the vowels e, uh, A and O. So it's late. No, le, no, 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 it. Just late, note. Okay. Um, Okay, so that's pretty much it for American English without going um, into black English. As I said, for the exam, 